Minister of Finance, the Honorable Camilla Gonzalez, makes his first budget presentation. And Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Honorable Sir Louis Straker, welcomes Foreign Minister of the Republic of China on Taiwan and his delegation to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. This is the API's presentation. Good evening. I am Sheridan Lewis. These stories are up next. Stay with us. Did you know that the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines implemented a ban on the importation of styrofoam products as of May 1, 2017? The ban on the usage of styrofoam for the sale or storage of food will be as at January 31, 2018. Did you know? A message brought to you by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Commerce and this station. Welcome back. In his first budget address, Minister of Finance, the Honorable Camilla Gonzalez, presented the 2018 budget under the realm of continuity and change, job creation, resilience, sustainable development, and new opportunities in a rapidly changing global environment. The budget presentation covered issues in the regional and global economy, productive sectors in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, other areas concerning the well-being of Vincentians, and infrastructural developments, among others. The third session of the 10th Parliament of the House of Assembly convened on Monday, 5th February 2018. Prior to the start of the budget, the Speaker of the House of Assembly, Honorable Jomo Thomas, entered the chamber in procession. The House was then suspended to await the arrival of His Excellency, the Governor General and Party. Upon arrival, the Governor General read the throne speech. The sitting of the House was then suspended after the Governor General's throne speech. His Excellency, Sir Frederick Ballantyne, then left the chamber. The sitting of the House of Assembly reconvened with the presentation of the budget address by Minister of Finance, Honorable Camilo Gonzalez. The 17th consecutive budget of the Unity Labour Party administration. I am doubly honored to report that even in the headwinds of global change and uncertainty, this budget presents tremendous cause for optimism, progress in deepening our people-centered policies, and genuine opportunities for innovation and growth. It would be unpardonable of me to not acknowledge the giant on whose shoulders I now gratefully stand, the longest serving finance minister in the history of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Dr. the Honorable Ralph Gonzalez. who served with distinction, passion, and creativity for the last 16 years. On his watch, and with his wise and creative guidance, his government recorded many landmark achievements, including the fact that there are 6,046 more employees and employers on the rules of the National Insurance Services. The total number of households increased by 6,300, or 20%, between the 2001 and 2012 census periods. Poverty was reduced, indigence and undernourishment was slashed, nine new secondary schools were constructed, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines achieved universal secondary education. <laughs> 10 early childhood centers, four primary schools, 13 learning resource centers, and a modern library were built. And, St. Vincent, and the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Community College was markedly expanded and renovated. The number of secondary school teachers increased by 300, from 405 to 705, an almost 75% increase. And the number of graduate teachers more than doubled. Community college enrollment increased by over 1,200 students per year, a 150% increase over his tenure. 
Vincentian enrollment at the University of the West Indies more than tripled, making St. Vincent and the Grenadines the largest source of students among non-campus territories. The Windward Highway, the South Leeward Highway, the Canoan Jet Port, the Argyle International Airport, the Rabaka Bridge, the Spring Bridge, the Cartel Bridge, and many others were completed on his watch. The Minister of Finance titled his presentation, Continuity and Change, Job Creation, Resilience, Sustainable Development, and New Opportunities in a Rapidly Changing Global Environment. He gave the regional and global outlooks that are of significance to St. Vincent and the Grenadines' economy. The economic well-being of St. Vincent and the Grenadines depends heavily on the knock-on effects of strong economic performances of the economies with which we are inextricably linked. Concomitantly, job creation and economic growth in St. Vincent and the Grenadines increases when trade in goods and services are enhanced. To be sure, the domestic market is vital, but it is a reality that a relatively small demand of 110,000 persons is unable to provide by itself the requisite economic propulsion for competitiveness, job, and wealth creation. This realization is at the core of the establishment of the Economic Union of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States and the quest for Caribbean single market and economy in CARICOM. These regional integration efforts effectively enlarge our country's small domestic economic space. Mr. Speaker, in the first three quarters of 2017, the world economy experienced an upswing in economic activity. Global growth was estimated at 3.7%, fueled largely by economic recovery in the United States, by strong performances in several other advanced economies, and by the major emerging markets and developing economies, mainly in Asia, which racked up an impressive 6.8% economic growth. During the first three quarters of 2017, the economies of Latin America and the Caribbean rebounded to realize 1.3% growth compared with a 0.9% contraction in 2016. This growth was mainly due to stable performances in Central America and in the Caribbean, as well as recoveries in a few economies, including Argentina. In the member states of the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union, the modest growth momentum of 2016 carried over into the first half of 2017 due to an expansion in tourism and construction. In the second half of 2017, there was a contraction in economic activities mainly because of the impact of two devastating hurricanes, Irma and Maria, which adversely affected Anguilla, Antigua and Barbuda, Dominica and St. Kitts and Nevis. Mr. Speaker, the International Monetary Fund's latest World Economic Outlook forecasts global growth this year of 3.7%, driven largely by better than expected, though still modest, growth in, developing, in developed countries. Within the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union, the World Economic Outlook predicts growth of 2.8% in 2018. I anticipate, Mr. Speaker, that this projection will be adjusted downwards in the wake of the devastation wrought by Hurricanes Irma and Maria on Eastern Caribbean member countries. More recently, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the IMF's Article 4 consultation predicted that our 2018 growth would be in the neighborhood of 2.1%, increasing to 3% in the medium term. We consider these predictions to be somewhat conservative but recognize that they depend in part on our ability to improve our productivity and the implementation rate of the public sector capital program and private sector investments in the real economy. And I will return to the issue of implementation, Mr. Speaker, time and again in this presentation. The United States of America has recently withdrawn from the Paris Climate Accord it has signaled a desire to cut USAID development assistance to Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean to zero dollars. It has sadly voiced its intention to slash funding to the World Bank 
which is a major development partner of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It has engaged in an unnecessary war of words and expressed interventionist intentions towards Venezuela, a major development partner and a fulcrum of regional integration and South-South cooperation. Additionally, certain ruling elements have been explicit, have been profanely explicit in expressing their desire to curtail migration from within our CARICOM region and from countries predominantly populated by people of color. I am confident that the majority of the American people and their elected representatives as a whole will not cave in to these nativist and un-American sentiments. However, each of those five policy emphases, anti-climate, anti-aid, anti-development, anti-solidarity, and anti-immigrant, have potential direct, medium, and long-term impacts on St. Vincent and the Grenadines and our developmental goals and aspirations. The degree to which our superpower neighbors evolving worldview of important political forces will alter our own developmental trajectory remains to be seen, but it requires careful attention and focused advocacy. Still, I reiterate that St. Vincent and the Grenadines is a friend of the United States of America and its people. We are neighbors. Our relationship has been mutually beneficial in socioeconomic terms, and we share excellent security ties. We remain confident that opportunities exist for strengthened relations. The United Kingdom is also radically reorganizing its relationship with the European Union and the world. For St. Vincent and the Grenadines, there are both potential pitfalls and opportunities in this reorganization. The extent to which a post-Brexit United Kingdom may reorient its trading relationships and the degree to which the European Union may adjust its development cooperation in the absence of UK advocacy for its former colonies are great unknowns. Around the world, we are witnessing a rise in insularity and xenophobia, a reckless retreat from the aspects of globalization that are most beneficial to developing countries like ours, a hasty and irresponsible withdrawal from the post-crisis era of strengthened regulatory oversight of our international financial architecture raises the specter of a return to the conditions that precipitated the 2008 crisis. Our remit in this time of volatile and rapidly shifting geopolitical realities is to be nimble and responsive to both the risks and the opportunities that change affords. The issue of trade between St. Vincent and the Grenadines and Trinidad and Tobago was highlighted by the Minister of Finance. He stated that it is one for urgent analysis and attention. Further, Trinidad and Tobago over the last five years has enjoyed a visible trade surplus, on average, of $149.9 million annually. Over the last five years, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, $167.1 million annually from Trinidad and Tobago, while exporting an average of $17.2 million to the Twin Island Republic each year. St. Vincent and the Grenadines pays Trinidad and Tobago for its imports in hard currency. At the same time, our exporters are experiencing tremendous difficulty in repatriating income earned in Trinidad and Tobago. This is negatively impacting our farming community in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So it is not only the traders who suffer, but also their suppliers, the small farmers of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the Bank of St. Vincent and the Grenadines have cooperated in devising a short-term foreign exchange solution for these agricultural traders. But a more lasting solution is required. The government has held several discussions with the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, the commercial banks in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and other stakeholders. But unfortunately, we have been unable to arrive at a satisfactory, lasting solution with the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago. At a recent meeting with local commercial banks, 
here in St. Vincent. We made a proposal that payments to Trinidad and Tobago be conducted in TT dollars. Once implemented, this measure will bring relief to the situation. The banks have indicated that they will need to discuss the proposal further with their head offices. However, Mr. Speaker, the fate of our farmers and traders cannot wait indefinitely on corporate consensus in far-flung bankers' boardrooms. As such, in order to ensure that our farmers and other exporters receive timely payments for their sales to and from Trinidad and Tobago, I hereby announce that as of the 1st of March 2018, the Ministry of Finance will enforce the relevant provisions of the Exchange Control Act with regard to payments in US dollars from St. Vincent and the Grenadines to Trinidad and Tobago. Accordingly, all US dollar payments to Trinidad and Tobago will require the prior approval of the Director of Finance and Planning. The Ministry of Finance will, of course, be happy to revisit this decision in the future if all parties can arrive at a less bureaucratically cumbersome solution. But it is wrong and unfair for St. Vincent and the Grenadines to be so disadvantaged in this matter. In touching on agriculture, Minister Gonsalves spoke on several areas, including fisheries and cannabis cultivation. The Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Labor and Industry will no doubt speak extensively on the new opportunities for work and production that now exist by virtue of his exemplary endeavors in the areas for which he exercises ministerial responsibility. This year, we expect to break ground on a new seafood packaging facility in Calakwa. The lease of existing state-owned fishery centers in Barley, Bekwe, Calakwa, Kanawan, Oya, and Union Island to the private sector and to cooperative interests is expected to unlock the entrepreneurial and business potential of these facilities. The recapitalization of the Farmers Support Revolving Fund, coupled with World Bank and EU programs to enhance competitiveness, modernize agribusiness in infrastructure, and secure market access will undoubtedly create new growth opportunities in this indispensable productive sector. The farmers and the agriculture sector have long been the cornerstone not only of economic development but social cohesion in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. This budget stands as a recommitment to the centrality of farming and fishing in the economic future of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The focus of the Honorable Minister of Agriculture on modernization, markets, and movement towards value-added agribusiness is nothing short of visionary. It is also jobs-focused. Now is the time for the young men and women of St. Vincent and the Grenadines to take a fresh look at the new opportunities for work and growth in a modern, diverse, and expanding agriculture sector. Today, global developments and shifting attitudes have presented St. Vincent and the Grenadines with an opportunity to leverage its homegrown experience and expertise in cannabis cultivation, albeit illicit, into a full-fledged industry that will take advantage of the positive medicinal properties of cannabis and its ability to produce pharmaceuticals that can be used in pain management, nausea prevention, seizure suppression, and in treating anxiety disorders, certain cancers, glaucoma, insomnia, etc. This year, we intend to continue wide and thorough consultations with the Vincentian public to canvas their views on the desirability of a well-regulated, clearly defined, export-oriented, medical cannabis industry in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Such an industry, if supported by the public and approved by the parliament, would position our country to take advantage of the economic opportunities presented by the rapidly expanding international market for medicinal cannabis products. 
The Minister of Finance is very optimistic about St. Vincent and the Grenadines' tourism product. He spoke of the Argyle International Airport, cruise tourism, and hotel development. Hyperbole, Mr. Speaker, is the stock in trade of the politician. However, there is one statement that I will make today without fear of contradiction. As a tourist destination, St. Vincent and the Grenadines is the most beautiful, most diverse, most culturally and historically distinctive, most special locale in the Caribbean. Our Honorable Tourism Minister, I am sure, will wax far more eloquently than I am capable of doing on the undeniable, tangible and intangible assets of St. Vincent and the Grenadines as a tourist destination. 2017 has excited the Vincentian imagination about the potential of tourism as never before. The completion of the Argyle International Airport and its momentous opening event last February was a signal achievement on our post-colonial development journey. The Argyle International Airport construction confounded its skeptics who first said it would never happen, and then said not before 2020. They claimed its construction would cost over $1.1 billion, which couldn't be found anywhere without bankrupting this country. They suggested that their own wind analysis and their own expertise led them to conclude that no plane would ever land there. Even days before the 14th February commencement, the Honorable Leader of the Opposition was dispatching hurried letters to the Eastern Caribbean Civil Aviation Authority, urging them to delay the airport opening. In retrospect, Mr. Speaker, we owe those critics a debt of gratitude. Were it not for their constant naysaying and doomsday prophecies, the Vincentian public may not have fully appreciated the engineering and economic miracle of airport construction in a mountainous country in the midst of a global economic crisis. We are now, Mr. Speaker, enjoying our third month of direct weekly flights of Air Canada from Toronto to Argyle International. This has been supplemented by regular flights on Sunwing Airlines. Today, I am thrilled to welcome the recent announcement by Caribbean Airlines that there will be weekly direct flights between Argyle International and John F. Kennedy International Airport in New York. Those flights, beginning on our 14th March National Heroes Day, will add growing capacity to our steadily expanding network of flights and connect us directly to our large and vibrant Vinci diaspora centered in New York. I have been advised too that Cal intends to put on another flight from AIA to JFK New York during the summer of 2018 from July 7th to August 25th to meet our carnival demand. I can also confirm that the Tourism Authority has finalized the necessary agreements with an additional major carrier from a separate North American hub. As with Air Canada and Caribbean Airlines announcements, the details of that new route will be made public by the airline in accordance with its own internal marketing and logistical imperatives. While the Honorable Tourism Minister will no doubt expand on these important developments, I wish to place on record my appreciation for the excellent work being done by him, his ministry, and the Tourism Authority in securing these direct flights and into help and helping to make AIA work. The 2018 fiscal year marks the beginning of a new thrust in the expansion of several important developments in the hotel industry, Minister Gonzalez stated. In the expansion of our hotel room stock, to capitalize on the opportunities created by the opening of the Argyle International Airport. Already, hotel expansion and new construction are underway nationwide, and the Minister of Tourism will elaborate on these. In Canawan, the Glossy Bay Marina project continues apace, with shops, restaurants, apartments, and ancillary facilities being added to the existing property. The expansion, the expectation, is for these additional works to be completed by the second quarter of 2018.
the Pink Sands Hotel, now under the management of the prestigious Mandarin Oriental brand, will also enjoy its first full year in business. On the mainland, the Black Sands Resort, a multi-million dollar development in Peter's Hope, has obtained the necessary first phase planning permissions and will commence construction this year. The project consists of 40 villas, totaling 160 rooms, and a 200-room hotel. Post-construction, the resort is anticipated to employ 300 Vincentians when it is fully operational. Mr. Speaker, the government has made no secret of its own intention to construct a state-owned, private sector-managed hotel or hotels to add 200 to 350 rooms to the current stock of high-quality tourist accommodation. The model is common throughout the region, with the Barbados Hilton, the Trinidad and Tobago Marriott, and the St. Kitts and Nevis Marriott being just a few of the many state-owned facilities that are managed by major international brands. Thanks to a recent fruitful conversation with a bilateral partner, I predict that the government will be breaking ground on a new hotel, hopefully in the fourth quarter of 2018, that will employ over 200 Vincentians. The closure of the Bocament Bay Resort has had an undeniably negative impact on tourist arrivals from the United Kingdom. Tourist arrivals from the United Kingdom were flat regionally on Brexit-related concerns, but this year in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, our stayover arrivals from the United Kingdom fell by 29%, due in no small part to the absence of the resort. Further, over 200 talented and hardworking Vincentians were forced to find other jobs and endured great difficulty when the resort was abruptly shuttered. Many of them are still owed wages from their work at the resort. Initially, the government was given unduly optimistic estimates about when the resort would reopen. Those estimates were based entirely on our conversations with the principals involved in the legal proceedings to navigate the hotel through the bankruptcy and insolvency process. However, today I can report that the investors and creditors of the resort, in communication with the bankruptcy trustee, have approved a plan for the management of the resort and are currently fine-tuning the details of management proposals from credible and competent entities with excellent track records in hotel management. The bankruptcy trustee has indicated that the final management agreement is expected to be signed in the coming weeks and that the resort will definitely reopen in advance of the 2018 tourist season. There will be, of course, a three-month period of rehabilitation prior to the tourist season to the existing facility. Minister Gonsalves said cruise arrivals have increased in 2017 and that yacht arrivals have also increased by a more modest percentage. Mr. Speaker, the opportunities presented by the surge in cruise arrivals and the projections for further growth in this subsector provide fertile ground for creative entrepreneurship and steady employment. In 2017, cruise arrivals to St. Vincent and the Grenadines skyrocketed. Preliminary tourism figures suggest that cruise arrivals are up a whopping 75% over last year. While the early returns from our primary cruise agent indicate that actual arrivals are in fact up close to 100%, with a 150% increase in capacity over last year. Let's take some numbers to, 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 to illustrate this, Mr. Speaker. The total capacity of all ships arriving in St. Vincent from October 2016 to January 2017 was 52,000. The comparable just concluded period, October 2017 to January 2018, wasn't 52,000, it was 130,000 a 150% increase. Contrary to what some believe, very little of this increase was due to the hurricane-related difficulties in Dominica, likely less than 10% of the arrivals. This spike in cruise ships was anticipated long before the hurricanes that affected Dominica and Antigua and Barbuda. 
and all indications are that this season's record arrivals rate will be surpassed in the upcoming season. We have all seen and heard the stories of the taxi and tour operators who have done extraordinarily well this cruise season. The truth is that there are many more diverse opportunities are begging for Vincentians to monetize this upsurge. We can and must do more to entice the visitors from their ships and across the length and breadth of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We can and must do more to encourage them to spend their money when they're here ashore. In my consultations with the tourism sector in advance of this budget presentation, I was heartened to hear how many businesses were enjoying significant direct benefits from the upsurge in cruise arrivals. Let us do more to capitalize and to monetize this growth. Similarly, yacht arrivals are also up, a more modest but still significant 8%. As we do more work to shed the unfortunate reputation created by some high-profile yacht crimes a few years ago, we expect that the yachting numbers will continue to increase, particularly given the increased options to fly into Argyle International and begin your Grenadine sailing experience directly from St. Vincent instead of from St. Lucia or Grenada. The growth in yachting creates opportunities for mainland marinas and yacht services, as well as wider spillover benefits. Many have compellingly argued that St. Vincent and the Grenadines' greatest natural competitive advantage in tourism lies in the yachting subsector. Now is the time for the business sector, the private sector, the entrepreneurs to capitalize on this area of growth. This year, in addition to expanding air access and expected growth by, in visitors by sea, the Ministry of Tourism is enhancing the viability of existing local destinations through investments in new facilities at Villa Beach and Brighton Salt Pond, continuation of the Cayo Heritage Village at Argyle, an enhancement to existing amenities at Cumberland, the Botanical Gardens, Waliabu, Black Point, Dark View Falls, Belmont Lookout, and the nature trails at Vermont, Trinity, Cumberland, and La Soufre. A number of infrastructure projects, including, but not limited to the rehabilitation of the Fort Charlotte Bridge, and the upgrade of the Montreal Gardens feeder road have obvious tourism benefits. Additionally, 2018 marks the beginning of a multi-year $13.4 million OECS regional tourism competitive project. This World Bank project will upgrade Anchorage sites, upgrade and enhance the visitor experience at Fort Charlotte, enhance the tourism authority's ICT capabilities and the ability to market online, and initiate a St. Lucia, St. Vincent, and the Grenadines, Grenada Inter-Island Ferry. In Information Communications Technology, Minister Gonsalves said the government is committed to utilizing information communication technology to drive and accelerate transformational development in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. ICT, in the Vincentian context, is a developmental accelerant, a leveler of playing fields, a means for enhancing new and existing businesses and an avenue for the delivery of improved services to the Vincentian people. In 2017, the government was proud of its best practice implementation of the Caribbean Regional Communications Infrastructure, that's CARSIP, the, incubation, the CARSIP incubation program. Currently, there are 16 Vincentian firms within the business incubation program. Businesses including manufacturing using wood and metal, developmental, development of robotic arms and 3D printing, video and media production, software development, mobile application development, and web development. That's right here in St. Vincent, Vincentian young people. Most of these small businesses have been performing above target and have experienced significant growth. To date, that program has expended over $1.1 million. On the training component of the CASIP program, approximately 400 persons have been trained in ICT courses such as CompTIA Network and Security, Digital Animation, Computer Fundamentals, Mobile Application Development, and Web Page Design. 
Over $1.2 million has been spent on the program thus far. We have also mandated the inclusion of a job placement component in ICT training activities and emphasize the creation of local content rather than the passive consumption of externally generated material. The 2018 budget includes critical infrastructural investments in connecting the Grenadines to our expanding national fiber backbone. $9.2 million will be spent under the World Bank's CARSIP program to facilitate the process, which will be executed in collaboration with a regional service provider. Such a significant investment in the ICT broadband infrastructure will ensure a full integration of the entire government service and reduction in administrative waste. The expansion of the government wide area network will connect all government buildings, health centers, the modern medical complex, and statutory corporations to a dedicated secure fiber line with high capacity bandwidth and access to high speed broadband at an affordable price with increased penetration rates. Other items covered in Minister Gonsalves' budget presentation included climate change and the environment, geothermal development and renewable energy, job creation and poverty reduction, citizen security, health and wellness, and education, among others. Reporting for the Agency for Public Information, I am Keisha Woodley. You're viewing a presentation from the Agency for Public Information. Coming up, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs welcomes the Taiwan Foreign Minister to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Stay with us. The program continues in just a moment. Mommy, mommy, can I have a snack, please? See, see, mommy, we're busy right now. Just take a snack from the counter. No, mommy. Those having too much salt in it. Can I have a fruit, please? That's an interesting choice. But where did you learn that? The people on Hellwood. No, mommy. You want to kill me with high blood pressure? Hellwood says whatever salt you eat for the whole day should not be more than one teaspoon, and that is just for adults, you know. Foods may contain more salt than you think. Reduce salt intake. Welcome back. Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Honorable Sir Louis Straker, was on hand at the Argyle International Airport to welcome the Foreign Minister of the Republic of China on Taiwan and his delegation to St. Vincent and the Grenadines for an official state visit on February 1st. As part of the official state visit, the signing of a bilateral agreement on the capacity building project for the prevention and control of diabetes in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the launch of electronic documents and records management system were conducted. The API Shana Daniel has more details in the following report. His Excellency Dr. David Tawe Li, the Foreign Minister of the Republic of China on Taiwan and his delegation, arrived at the Argyle International Airport on February 1, 2018. They were greeted by this country's Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Honorable Sir Louis Straker, along with Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Mrs. Sandy Peters Phillips, and other local officials. The Taiwanese delegation was given a brief tour of the Argyle International Airport before leaving the facility. Later that day, the Taiwanese delegation met at the conference room of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for the official ceremony for two bilateral projects, namely the Electronic Document and Records Management System Project for St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the Diabetes Prevention and Control Agreement signing. At 
that official ceremony, Minister of Health, Wellness and the Environment, the Honorable Luke Brown, stressed the importance of the signing ceremony to the local health sector. But this is the story as far as diabetes is concerned. In 2001, the number of self-reported cases of persons with diabetes was 3,715. In 2012, that number shot up all the way to 6,308. That is a substantial increase. Diabe well, a substantial increase, an increase in fact of just under 70%, 69.8% if you wanted precision. And this affects persons who are of productive age, persons in that 45 to 64 age group, for instance, have been found to be the ones with the greatest prevalence of diabetes. And in that age group, of the persons who reported that they had diabetes, 45.3% of them were found in that age group. So you could imagine how debilitating this could be on productivity. You could imagine what this represents in terms of days off from work. You could imagine what it means in terms of the cost of medicines and medications, medi medications either directly to the individual or to the state. And it is something that has to be addressed and has to be addressed comprehensively. And it's not a case where it only impacts productivity and causes sick leave and things of that kind. But it has been reported, it has been ranked as the third leading cause of death in St. Vincent and the Grenadines as of 2016, with 86 or 9.3% of death certificates listing it as the underlying cause of death. During the period, that is in 2016, during the period, if you wanted a slightly longer term view. During the period 2012 to 2016, diabetes was ranked second. And uh, it was ranked as the third leading cause of death in the period 2015 to 2016. So you have a breakdown of the time of that time period, 2012 to 2016. So in the 2012 to 2014 period, it was the second leading cause of death. And in the 2015 to 2016 period, it was the third leading cause of death. And in particular, in 2016, we had 86 or 9.3% of persons dying having diabetes as an underlying problem. Minister Brown also outlined the particulars of the agreement. The agreement has a primary objective. And as that primary objective, it is to assist the government. Taiwan is going to assist the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines with the fight against diabetes. The parties to the agreement, I just want you to have some of the salient points, are on the one hand, the government of the Republic of China through its International Cooperation and Development Fund and the Mickey Hospital. And on the other hand, the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, represented by the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment. The budget for the project is just over two million US dollars, the bulk of which, you might even say almost all of which, is going to be provided by the government of the Republic of China and Taiwan. And St. Vincent and the Grenadines would make a modest contribution by comparison in different arrangements of in-kind, different in-kind arrangements. Now, this project has a sensible rationale, as you have seen, and it is motivated by recommendations that have come out of the PAHO document on interventions for the prevention and management of diabetes. There are several strategies which we would pursue under this agreement. We're going to assist in planning effective integrated care strategies and practices on the prevention and control of diabetes, strengthen the ability of integrated diabetes care in health facilities, improve the health and improve the health self-management of community people 
for the prevention and control of diabetes. This is tied to something that we want to do in general for the renewal of primary health care. Because where diabetes is concerned and where non-communicable diseases, more broadly speaking, are concerned, it's important for us to pay attention to the old adage that prevention is better than cure. So this is going to be reflected in our approach going forward, and we are very happy to have such a notable partner in our project for fighting this disease and seeking to eliminate it or at least minimize its impact on the population of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I welcome this moment wholeheartedly and I believe it is an important development for healthcare in this country. And the Electronic Document and Records Management System project falls under the Ministry of Finance, Economic Planning, Sustainable Development and Information Technology. Minister the Honorable Camilla Gonzalez outlined the practicality of this project. Those of you who work in the government know that if a file has to leave my office to go to Luke's office, it is written by hand, it is placed in an envelope, it's given to a gentleman or a lady, an office attendant, who, when he or she has sufficient files that he or she feels it's time for her to him or her to leave the office and deliver them, she will walk leisurely from my office, stopping to see her friends along the way, until she arrives at Luke's office with a little book, and somebody on that end will sign the little book to say, yes, the file that was sent from over there has arrived over here. And at some point, 24 to 48 hours after it leaves my office, it will arrive at Minister Brown's office, at which point he will make an annotation and send it back, and the process will repeat itself. And a week after I first sent the correspondence, I will receive the response from Minister Brown. That's a slight exaggeration, but not much. And... Then, five years later, when somebody wants to find that correspondence between Minister Brown and I, another different office attendant covers his or her mouth and goes into a very dusty room filled with damp and rotting files to try to dig up the document that I sent to Luke and Luke sent back to me. And there are questions about, well, when was it stamped? And what was the date on the stamp? And is that Minister Brown's signature? Or is that Minister Gonzalez's signature? And the upshot is that document sharing between and among the ministries and in the public service have not advanced into the 21st century. They are somewhere trapped between colonialism and the 21st century, but they haven't arrived in the 21st century yet. And if we want to be a government that embraces the concept of a digital government, and if we want to embrace the concept of e-governance, electronic governance, we have to do better with basic, basic things like documents. Minister Gonzalez further explained how the system will work. This system, which is in the neighborhood of almost two million US dollars, will involve at the outset documents from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, the Service Commission, IT, Ministries of Finance, documents and information in the customs, in um, inland revenue, in tax, and at the treasury. I don't, I don't know if I'm missing anybody, but that will be the, the initial core. And we will refine there a system by which employees in those departments get smart cards, public key infrastructure cards for government members, that will have data on their cards about who they are, that will allow them to sign documents digitally, that will allow them to 
enter buildings that will allow them to, well, maybe you can see this document, but that, 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 not that document, because this one is more secure or more classified than that one, and will facilitate the free flow of secure information between and among the ministries of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and will lead to the efficiency, greater efficiency and reliability of information therein. Government and people of Taiwan has assi have assisted us in our cybersecurity protections. It has assisted us in our certification procedures to make sure that we are doing the right things um, to secure our servers, to secure our data. And they have cooperated with us extensively in the areas of training and equipping the Ministry of Information Technology. This project is another step on the pathway to e-government, full e-government in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We live in a multi-island state, and it is difficult for people in the far-flung areas of St. Vincent and the Grenadines to have to come to town to do basic things that a government expects them to do, to have to come to town to get your driver's license, to have to come to town to pay certain bills, to line up for things that don't require us to line up anymore because we all have a computer in our pocket. But before we get to the state of seamless e-government, and the government and people of Taiwan know a little bit about this and they're, they've committed to helping us along the way, we have to make sure that documents within the government can move around securely and efficiently. And this is what this is about. So don't see this as a project in and of itself. Don't see it as an end in and of itself, but see it as an important platform and foundational step in a journey towards a more digitally active, digitally aware, and nimble government that embraces um, all of the electronic possibilities. To commemorate the launch of the public key infrastructure project, we will now invite Sir Louis Straker, His Excellency Lee Dawei, and Honorable Camilo Gonzalez to please stand on the count of three. They will place their hands on the ball. One, two, three. This is to show a sign of partnership between the government of the Republic of China on Taiwan and the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines in achieving many goals now and for years to come. The Taiwanese Foreign Minister, His Excellency Dr. David Tawe Lee, said that his government and people are happy to cooperate with St. Vincent and the Grenadines in these two projects. We'll be launching two joint initiatives, a diabetes prevention and control program and a smart card authentication system. This has been made possible due to Taiwan's uh, recent R&D achievements in public health and government efficiency. We are happy to share with you our successes in diabetes prevention and help reduce the health risks to your people. We also want to provide our information, security technologies, and related accomplishment for your reference. I'm, uh, I have the every confidence that these uh, two programs will have a positive impact on the lives of our people. They will contribute to your nation's uh, social development and welfare. Just as our other long-term collaborations uh, has done in such areas as uh, infrastructure development, education, and cultural, agricultural technology, and human resources. Our two countries lie in thousands of miles apart. Yet since establishing diplomatic relations in 1981, we have grown ever closer and our partnership has deepened. 
I want to take this opportunity to thank the government and the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines for your solid support for Taiwan's uh, international participation over the years. Our government will continue with its policy of uh, steadfast diplomacy and mutual assistance and for mutual benefit. Further strengthening bilateral cooperation and enhancing the welfare of uh, our two peoples. Thank you so much. Delivering the feature address at the ceremony, this country's Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Honorable Sir Louis Straker, said that the two agreements are of utmost importance to the government and people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Today, we are here to sign a very important agreement, which we sincerely acknowledge and support. One, the agreement on the capacity building project for the prevention and control of diabetes in SVG. This agreement is expected to strengthen our diabetes management system. And secondly, witness the launching of the electronic document and records management system for St. Vincent and the Grenadines. In closing, I would like to say that I am confident that through our efforts and commitment, we will have the ability to achieve more by continuing to develop even stronger bonds of friendship between the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the Republic of China on Taiwan. I would also like to take this opportunity to reassure you that the relevant line ministries will do what is necessary for the successful implementation of both agreements. Once again, I welcome the delegation, the minister and his delegation from Taiwan, not necessarily in their official capacity, but as true friends, as member of the Vincentian family. We have been recipients of a never-ending stream of generosity and benevolent activity from Taiwan. We could not and will never forget what Taiwan has meant to St. Vincent in terms of its development. And I personally, and this government, and this the cabinet, everyone is fully committed to that relationship. At the ceremony, the Information Technology Department also presented prizes to children who had participated in a public key infrastructure PKI promotion. The Taiwanese Foreign Minister and his delegation were hosted to a dinner later that evening at the Young Island Resort. For the API, I am Shana Daniel reporting. We've come to the end of this evening's presentation from the Agency for Public Information. Join us again on Thursday for another program. For recaps and further updates, check out our Facebook page at API SVG. On behalf of the production team, thank you for viewing. I'm Sheridan Lewis. Good night.